is this our, our fourth one of these cafe talks? So Joe with a uh, weed scientist, uh, Naeem and I are slow health specialists, and we really just wanted to give an opportunity to ask some questions for PP and, and use of cover crops. Um, we've had some great discussions, but um, hopefully today will be a little bit different even. So when, you, when you're using cover crops, it's important to kind of identify what you wanna do with the, those cover crops. So in most cases with prevent plant, we're trying to manage water, but you can also double up on some of those goals by improving the seed bed, breaking some compaction, catching nitrogen that may have in the field. Um, I'm guessing that not a whole lot of nitrogen was applied last fall, so um, there may not be a whole lot of that to catch, but, but there are plenty of different options if you can figure out what you wanna do on your field that really is helpful for designing a mix. And then also thinking of the next crop you want to put on there in 2021 and making sure that we don't pick something that's going to, going to cause issues with your next crop. Um, when you pick your mix, I usually pick mine based on root structures just because I think below ground most of the time. Um, but here's an example of something like dwarf Essex rapeseed, um, which has a great root structure on it, a nice kind of thick root with also some of these fine roots that can build, build aggregates. Um, but if you have canola in rotation, you don't want to use brassicas like dwarf Essex rapeseed or radish or turnip because of club root concerns. So we also need to be aware of what disease issues you may have between your cash crop and if those cover crops are hosts, then we need to stay away from them um, in your cover crop mix. Uh, this is another example of a, a PP field from last year um, that when they pushed up the grazing date to September 1st, this is what they put out there to graze. Um, and this is using plenty of moisture. Uh, but another example of if you're gonna go to corn next year, make sure that you include a grass or a legume in your mix because both of them are mycorrhizal. So they form those fungal associations that you need for phosphorus uptake in corn. They kind of prime the soil and get it ready for that. And if you don't have those associations, like if you just have a radish and turnip that you're broadcasting um, because it's convenient and the seed size is small, you're gonna have issues with phosphorus uptake in your corn the following year. So make sure you're including either a legume with it, like peas are a great option, or um, just some kind of oats or barley or something with it that's gonna be mycorrhizal um, to, be, to set the soil up for your corn next year. Um, here's another example of a full season cover crop mix. This one wasn't on PP, but it was um, intended for grazing and high water use. Uh, so this is a sandy soil with a very high water table. Um, and so sorghum is one of the major components in this mix. Um, it's an excellent warm season for drying out wet soils. Um, typically we look at two pounds per acre is enough in a mix, so it won't take over the mix, but it'll be a part of the mix. Um, it puts on a lot of biomass, so you can see how tall it is here. It dies at the first frost, um, or sign of freezing. So it's, it'll die quickly in the fall, but, it, um, but if you feel like this is too much biomass, then, then maybe this isn't the one for you. Um, back in, when was it, 2014, um, we had some plots down in Wapiton uh, where we looked at some different cover crop mixes on just the edge of a field because we wanted to see what the different mixes would do for moisture and also nitrogen and, and to get familiar with what, what, what options there are. Um, so here's, here's what we found. Uh, this light blue line are plots where we just used tillage um, or just kept the soil bare and chem fallow um, on those acres. And then these are all cover crop mixes that we used. And so actually, as we got more diverse in our mix, the more moisture we used. Um, so you can see this mix, this green line here, is cereal rye, dwarf Essex rapeseed. We had some sugar beet seed in there, sunflower, pea, and flax. And what you can take away from this really is that the moisture content is dried evenly down through the soil profile, so down to 35 inches is where we were measuring, versus where you just use tillage to control the weeds and, and manage PP, where you still have this bulge of moisture right below the surface that's gonna cause issues for next year. So whatever cover crop you put out there is gonna help make that soil profile more uniform and, and dry it out. Um, here's the, the nitrate N. Um, levels in the soil, you can see here again is the, is the bare soil and how the, the nitrate just stuck around um, and probably leached through that profile. But then here the cover crops took up that nitrate and, um, and held on to it for whenever, we still don't know when it would be released um, back to the next crop, but, um, but at least held on to it and kept it as a resource. 
And then this is what the what some of those diverse mixes look like um, in the winter going in. This is December 31st. Um, so you can see that the residue cover really isn't that much different from this is barley residue over here. Um, it's really not that much different and it wouldn't be that difficult to plant into. Um, so all this that biomass we had really just kind of melts away with some of those radish and turnip. These are basically turned into styrofoam. They're easy to to run equipment through. So um, the best thing to do is to leave that biomass in the soil where it can decompose well versus working it up um, in the fall because maybe you're a little bit nervous about how it might be the next spring. So when you work up these radish and turnips, they just sit on the surface and they freeze and they're really difficult uh, to manage the next year. Um, you know, there's uh, some conversation about should you do a monoculture or a mix? Um, either way you look at it, you need to start with a clean field. Uh, so make sure your weeds are under control if this wind ever dies down so we can do some spraying. Um, but we'll talk about some of those options. So here's a, a $20 an acre mix, um, 28 pounds of radish, turnip, sunflower, oats, and peas. Um, so this is a, a great diverse mix, um, maybe good for fields where you don't have a lot of weed pressure, um, unless you can take care of that before you seed it. But do any repair on ruts, did, do any ditching you need to do to get water to move before seeding a cover crop, because they won't fix ruts. Um, they'll, they'll help manage the soil there, but they're not gonna fix deep ruts. So make sure you prep the field first. And then here's a monoculture with cereal rye. You could seed that midsummer. It'll stay low to the ground. Um, it won't um, head out or anything because it needs to vernalize over winter. So this is a good option, um, good cheap option for, for fields. Um, if you're using grasses, one of the things you could do is consider a mix of grasses like oats and barley or um, you know rye and oats or something like that. And, and maybe that'll help you avoid issues uh, with PP payments just because there's no chance you're going to take it for harvest. Um, but that's a conversation to have with your, with your insurance agent. Um, and you could, should think about terminating a cover crop, especially if it's just a grass, before it heads out. Um, that's going to keep the, the vegetative material easier uh, to manage and less like straw. So you could think about that too. Um, and Andrew Friscap was telling me that oats are more favorable on 2020 PP than other grasses before a wheat or barley crop next year. Um, they're, they can host scab and things like that, but they're not a good host. Uh, and some root routes may be possible. Um, but it's low risk compared to other options. So, so that's a good thing to know too. And I think Andrew's gonna be on the um, next episode of Field Check that we have come out on Monday. So um, talking about that, because we wanna think about disease transfer amongst grasses as well. Um, so that's what I have to kind of start the conversation. Um, it's great, we've got 19 people on the call now. So does anyone have a question that they, or field they wanna talk about? You can come up with some options. I'm gonna ask Joe some questions then. So, so Joe, when I was driving on 94, I saw just a bunch of fields that were, that were clearly corn that was harvested this spring um, or this summer, maybe even now, I guess we're summer. Um, and it had a lot of weed pressures in it. And a lot of those weeds were, were fairly large. You know, what, what would they need to do to manage that before coming in and seeding a cover crop or something like that? Well, it would kind of depend on the weeds. Um, yeah, depending on where you're at and what you have, they may still be largely glyphosate susceptible, in which case, I always kind of hate to still say, like they can still work on some large weeds as long as they're not resistant. Um, otherwise, some of these, uh, we've, we've got some of our resistant weeds getting quite large now too. And at, at that point, one of the best options, and you're gonna not like when I say this word, but tilling them would be uh, pretty good, especially if you have resistance and as large as some of them are getting. Plus, we have some of our weeds starting to flower already. I know we found lambs, quarters, and water hemp that are already flowering and become a little bit more difficult to control once they are flowering. So in that case, you know, if they're still small and flowering, you could do something like Gramoxone, um, which would then allow um, to plant a cover crop because there's no residual there. Um, but some of these that are starting to get away from us, depending on the weeds that are in there, you know, tillage may be the next best thing based on weed size. Other 
potential options, but we really recommend sometimes more in pasture settings would be mowing and then allowing it for a couple of days of regrowth, but tillage would be more effective than that in, in most cases, especially on these fields that you're still looking at seedbed preparation if you wanted to plant a cover crop. Would vertical tillage be enough to knock back some of those weeds or would it not be, not be enough? From what, from what I've seen, they'd have to be very small. Vertical tillage is not really a good weed control tillage tool. Uh, like I said, when they're small, it can, we can see some of these differences in vertical tillage in the fall, uprooting some winter annuals when they're small and, and shallow rooted. But, you know, anything that's, I'll just say over a couple inches tall, um, probably won't work too well. And once you're over six inches tall, they're, they're rooted deep enough that a vertical tillage won't, it'll just tick them off. Okay, yeah, we don't want, well, you certainly don't want to see cover crops into something that you know you didn't kill all the weeds first whether it's with tillage or um one of those systems I, i'd hate to see some of those no-till fields get worked up with tillage um to control the weeds so i'm wondering what other options there might be if, if somebody's maybe four or five years into no-till and they don't want to work up that field but they've got you know a lot of weed pressure because there's nothing they could do until they got the corn off <clears throat> I did see a really nice, um, well, it was a cornfield that was being harvested um, that had rye flown onto it last year. And the, and the rye had actually, it was headed out in that cornfield as they were harvesting. And they said the traffic ability was unbelievable. Um, they didn't have any issues with all that green material there. Um, so maybe if we're anticipating, hopefully we don't have this issue again next year, but if we're anticipating these you know, spring harvests, you know, on, on some of those fields that we know are gonna be challenging, maybe getting the rye out there whether it's flying it on or something this year and being kind of proactive to get it growing for next year and managing weeds and, and giving some trafficability um, if we have to harvest corn again in the, in the spring. But hopefully that doesn't happen. Nobody wants to think about that, I'm sure. <laughs> Abby, I wonder if, if there was some standing corn stalks, if, if uh, a fire could be uh, a way to control some of those weeds if you still had that uh, and you wanted to avoid that tillage pass. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, Joe, fire's pretty effective on weed seeds, isn't it? Well, two different things here. On if, he's, if Tim's talking about the standing weeds, then it should, you know, unless there's some fire hardy ones, which there could be, should, you know, control some of those weeds that are in there. Weed seed, it's going to vary by species. Um, I'd really like to dig into the literature to, to figure out, but basically the harder the seed coat, the more likely it would be to survive fire. And what we've learned for weed seed is you basically want to have, like for wind row burning, narrow and taller rows to get the fire deeper. In general, talking to weed scientists, not only in the U.S. and around the world, we're shying away from fire as weed seed control, uh, simply because they tend to get up and move. Mm. But if you're going to for the corn stalks anyways, um, and could do it in a safe manner, then it certainly would um, help control some of the weeds that are out there. And then, yeah, you wouldn't have to till the ground if you didn't want to. <clears throat> no, and that's, I mean, I've seen some, some fields where, um, you know, we like to think of, of burning the stalks and, and the residue as kind of the last option um, after you try several other things, but, but I have seen, you know, fields where, where we did burn them, they were about five years into no-till and that was our only option really to get a crop in the ground. Um, so after it was burned, the, the crop was immediately planted and, and then they followed it with a cover crop to try to replace some of that material that they burned, some of the organic matter that maybe was lost or some of the nitrogen that could have been lost. So, um, so I think it's pretty critical in that situation to make sure that you get another cover crop in there or try something to, to kind of build the soil back up a little bit after burning. Um, we've got a question from Kelly that says, what is the best burn down option for no-till glyphosate, bufosinate, and para, I don't know all these word, weed terms, but uh, what is the best application before or after planting and how many days before planting? Uh, weeds are large, <clears throat> as large as fields and have not been touched yet. And so, again, it kind of depends on what's in the field. In general, as long as you don't have a lot of glyphosate resistant weeds, 
what can I say, glyphosate will be the best because it manages the, the most weeds. It's got a large broad spectrum of, of weeds it can control, especially if you have grasses that are in there that are starting to grow, it's going to be the, the best of those herbicides on grasses. Uh, next, out of those three, I'd go with Paraquat. Um, but glufosinate can be good. Uh, most people, uh, Liberty is the, the main brand name, but there's plenty of generics now. Um, with glufosinate, we need heat and humidity to make it work best. We certainly have the heat yet um, right now. Um, humidity kind of depends on where you're at in the state. It tends to work better in the eastern half of the state, which is probably where everyone's calling in from for, for this purpose. Um, and uh, I'd like to be a little bit more humid, but we certainly have the daylight hours and the heat right now, the glufosinate. Would probably be pretty close to paraquat. I put paraquat a little bit higher though, uh, especially on grass activity. It's going to be a little bit better than glufosinate. Um, something else we could do with glyphosate to help out some of our resistant weeds, especially if you have uh, mare's tail or horseweed in there, we can put an ounce of sharpen in. And that'll help some of our broadleaf weed that glyphosate may be weak on. And it still allows us to do some of our cover crop options, particularly small grains or if you want to put field peas in, uh, we could have that ounce of sharpen in there and it won't have residual, um, won't have a whole lot of residual at all and it shouldn't affect at least those uh, pairings with cover crops. As far as best application before or after planting, um, either or at this point, you know, if you wanted to plant today while it's windy um, and have this window this weekend where we, um, should have hopefully some lower winds, then I'd get what done today, what you could get done and then spray on this weekend. Shouldn't see too much of a difference, just the highest risk is uh, depending on what you plant um, and how you plant it. If you're, if you're drilling it in, I'd go ahead and drill it and spray it when I can. Uh, flying it on, I don't think we have enough data of spraying those herbicides over top seed on the surface as to what type of effect we might have, but. I'd say as long as the crop isn't up before at, or after planting, you'll be fine, um, which kind of answers the days before planting. I think that answers most of that question. Now we've got some seeding questions, it looks like, Abby. Okay, let's see, what kind of rates, um, do, what kind of rates for broadcasting oats alone or barley alone? That sounds like a good one for Naeem, since you've been looking at rates and yeah, I would say, depending upon the situation, how early we are planting, I would go with 40, 45 pounds to 60 pounds maximum. That would be the range. Um, and I, um, if we look at, um, I would like to ask question, one question, are you looking to get uh, planted on PP acres? If that's what you want, uh, then you may have to wait to plant your cover crop and plant it after, after the late planting period, which is roughly 15 to 25 days after the final planting dates. So that still means somewhere early in July. So you're gonna get very good growth. I would stick to about 40, 50, 45 to 50 pounds per acre. That would be the oats. And I think the second question, Abby, is about sorghum and sunflower mix. Sargum, we already discussed, Marisol mentioned that, about two pounds. We shouldn't go over two pounds. Uh, sunflowers, I'm not 100% sure about, but I would also say that's a bigger seed. Yeah, I'm not sure you'd want to broadcast sunflower. I don't think you'd get a good catch. Um, any of those, like sunflower and peas, right? I mean, we'd want to get those in the ground, especially because peas like to be two inches. Yep. Um, Broadcasting should always be the number second choice. Um, I mean, I've done that personally, but I would say drilling is always better. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think if you, know, if you are going to broadcast and then maybe thinking about running some kind of vertical tillage over it or something to kind of throw some soil around um, to cover up that seed, then, then just keep the seed sizes small. Don't do that with peas or sunflower. I don't, I'm not sure what size sorghum seed is, but it's, I don't think it's very big, so that could possibly work in a broadcast and then slightly worked in. Um, 
which I think, I think that's why we get so much of the radish and turnip mixes, just radish and turnip on these acres is because they're easy to broadcast and you don't have to refill the hopper very much to, to get it out there. Um, but definitely, you know, adding in some of those oats would be a good thing. Um, like Naeem is saying at 40 pounds or so, 40 to 60. Um, let's see, we've got a question again on what is the best planting window, early July, late July, no-till drilling pea. Uh, so they're gonna be no-till drilling pea, soybean, clover, Sudan grass, safflower, and buckwheat. Um, and no-till drilling winter wheat into it in September. Um, so we've, we've been talking about that quite a bit, Naeem, on, the, on some yeah. of the things that could bolt or, um, you know, go to seed. Um, you know, and I think that we mentioned some of the crops which can go to seed. We mentioned that if we plant them after 15th of July, that would be better if I remember correctly. I would, I would just plant around the middle of July. I would not uh, plant them too late because often here in North Dakota, and I'm, I'm sitting in a bubble, but it's still, I would say that overall, we, we don't have a big planting uh, window or growing season. So if you plant it, if, if the goal is to, you know, have decent biomass and root growth, I would, I would plant it in um, at least middle of July. Late July would be fine too. It has worked wonderful, wonderfully here, uh, but I, I wouldn't drag it into August, personally speaking. Yeah, I think, and as long as you don't have, I mean, radish is the one that concerns me going in too early, and I won't plant radish before July 15th, um, just because of the seed production. And, and honestly, if you put radish in early, it doesn't put on that, that thick root that you want anyways. Um, so in this case, she's got peas, soybean, clover, Sudan grass, safflower, and buckwheat. So she, you may be okay. I mean, buckwheat grows really quickly and will probably go to seed. Um, anywhere where we, we've used buckwheat as a full season, I haven't had issues controlling it. Joe, have you ever had issues with herbicide and controlling um, tame buckwheat? No, and to be honest, we use that as a indicator species in our adjuvant work where we use cut rates because if we use full rates of herbicides, we kill everything. So it, buckwheat's relatively easy to control if it did happen to go to seed. Okay, so they, they may want to get this seeded. They may want to get it seeded early because if they're going to winter wheat in September, they've got to get some growth growth on this and I don't see too much in there that would that would concern me for for going to seed. The only th question I would ask them that um, if they planted this uh, this mix for example in middle of July by September there would be very decent growth. Mm -hmm. are, what are they going to do? Are they going to clip it first and then come back and plant winter wheat or spray it? Kelly, if you could give us some feedback on that. And if you want, Kelly, you can just unmute yourself too, unless yeah. some people say they like typing better than talking, so <laughs> just fine too. Um, the other thing I would think in that mix, um, since you, you're gonna use some soybean in it, um, I'm trying to think what else might be hosts for soybean cyst nematode, um, but just be, be cautious of that. Let me look, um, I'm gonna see what, what we have on our, on our webpage, we have a, a table with um, potential cover crops that are hosts for soybean cyst nematode. And so if you have SCN, then you need to be really cautious um, not to plant those hosts in there. So Kelly answered, uh, Abby, she said she's gonna direct seed in, um, into green, possibly roll down the cover crop. Uh, the only thing I would say that uh, just be careful when you're planting winter wheat, I heard John Lukacs used to be here and he used to work on winter wheat a lot. He used to say that just before um, frost or snow cover, first snow cover, if winter wheat is, you know, um, four, five, three inches tall, chances of it surviving in the next year are better. So if you planted, um, if your cover crop is competing too much with the winter wheat and you planted it, it may germinate, but it may not go to the kind of like the, you know, growth level it should be. So there may be more winter kill, you know, so 
just keep that in mind. And I would say too, if you're hoping, so let's see, she's hoping that the frost takes out the warm seasons and leaves the clovers. Um, as far as, as cold tolerance on clovers, um, Marisol has told me before that red clover is one of the, is more cold tolerant than things like balanza or crimson. Um, so I don't know if you've ordered your mix already and you're trying to figure out which clover you want to put in there, but red clover, if you want it to overwinter, um, may be a good option. That's kind of what we're using some of our mixes where we want to get it to overwinter. And I've seen mixed things on having winter wheat with a cover crop growing in it um, that overwinters or even I had a, a farmer one time seeded, um, put in his winter wheat and seeded radish with it. Um, and he, he had decent results with that. Um, but I've also seen where winter wheat and radish were growing at the same time where it, it reduced the yield of winter wheat the following year. So, um, so it's, it's great to have those covers growing with winter wheat, but just be cautious because it may, if it's too thick, it might um, reduce your, your stand and cause some issues. So, so maybe having some overwinter is great, but not all of it. Good questions though. So we'll stay quiet for a minute. If anyone has a question they want to unmute and ask. Um, I think Kelly, uh, Kelly edited a comment. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Considering red clover, beer seam clover, and yellow blossom sweet clover, I haven't ordered the mix yet. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think red, red clover should overwinter. Um, we also have, let's see, there's Chris is on the call and Colin, both with seed companies. I don't know if somebody wants to talk about the um, beer seam clover and yellow blossom sweet clover. I, I would just add one thing that sweet clover is a little bit more salt tolerant and I hope that you're not facing that issue. And if you're not facing that issue, I would go with the red clover based on Marisol's feedback because that's what you want to get out of the clovers. Yeah. And um, can we plant those clovers in mid July with success to produce nitrogen? <clears throat> Which legume species would you recommend to produce nitrogen? Um, I think I just, I haven't had a ton of luck with clovers, um, even in a full season, they just don't put on a lot of biomass. It's, it's nice that they have the option, you know, with the red clover to possibly overwinter. Um, but I really, I'm, I like peas a lot. I think they're just, um, especially inoculated, make sure you, you inoculate whatever legume you're using. That seems to be the step I always forget. Um, <clears throat> but I think you need about 60 days to produce nitrogen um, to offset the cost of the seed. Um, so I usually, I usually go with peas if I'm going later in the season, like say I'm seeding a, a legume after wheat harvest, um, I would go with a faba bean because I really like the dark residue that that produces. Um, and in any mixes I've had where you've used clovers, I do just use kind of red clover or with some of the sunflower work we've done, we use crimson clover, but um, but I just, I haven't had a lot of luck with it. I don't know if anybody else has been trying clovers. Um, just seems like peas really do the trick. You know, of course, then if you're seeding peas, you have to figure out how you're going to get those at two inches down. Um, and then some of the other small seeded stuff. And that seems to be easy enough to do, um, setting two different depths. But I think, um, and I, maybe I should put that link on the, <clears throat> we have a whole prevent plant webpage link on the, on the NDSU Soil Health webpage. And we have all this prevent plant information on there. And um, I should maybe link to some of the work that Marisol has done um, that she has on her page, her webpage, that has nitrogen production of legumes. Um, she's tested all kinds of different legumes and looked at how much nitrogen uh, they produce in the biomass and um, and so that may be useful if, as people are trying to pick what they want to put in there. And Joe, I'm assuming a, a, something like a clover that overwinters is easy to take care of the next year and clean up in a field? Oh, yeah. Yeah, legumes are, are pretty easy to clean up. 
Because I could see, you know, if we have another kind of war of, you know, where we didn't, our soils didn't freeze, um, we had tons of different things over winter this year. And, and I'm wondering, you know, if that happens again, a lot of these cover crops that are on PP could, could overwinter and you just want to make sure that you can manage it in the spring if that happens. Yeah, I think this, this year we saw um, some farmers I work with though, we don't advise the use of annual ryegrass. Um, some farmers I work with like to use it and they had that over winter this year. Um, I think some of the radish and turnip overwintered. Um, Joe, I know you were finding a bunch of weeds early, early this year too. I don't know if those overwintered or just the seed was right there and I think it's in that case what we were finding. Well, two things. We are we have gotten a lot of calls and emails about some weird winter annual weeds that we don't get in most years, and that's kind of linked to the rain last fall. So those had overwintered. Uh, but also many of our summer annuals, I think they were, you know, once the snow melted, we weren't frozen, at least in the eastern third of the state. So I think as soon as conditions are right, they germinated kind of earlier than than we would typically see in other years. So Naeem, you kind of mentioned before, you know, cover crops for salt that are more salt tolerant. Um, do you want to talk about those recommendations? Yeah, so um, the annuals, for example, the most salt tolerant ones are barley, oats, sugar beets and if you just want to have a simple mix you know you can just have barley and oats and sugar beets um, if you want to have a legume i would say it's not super to salt tolerant but sweet clover would be a little bit more salt tolerant than let's say alfalfa or other clovers um, but if you're depend depends how high the soil ac is so for example, just to give you an example, if our soil EC is um, between four to six or seven, you could plant um, barley, oats, sugar beet, and maybe sweet clover. And if you want to graze it, which may not be an option, it could be an option for you even on PP acres. Mm -hmm. We have checked the rules. If you planted your cover crop mix, after the late planting period and you then cut it or hay it or graze it before November 1st, you could still get 35% of your PP payment. And you could utilize that for your grazing, for, you know, for grazing or haying. I would go with, uh, say, if I'm having a mix of three crops, um, I would put more sugar beet seed because they don't really do very well in terms of uh, competition. About 12 pounds of oats, 12 pounds of uh, um, barley, and about four, four and a half pounds of sugar beet seed. Um, that, that would be the seeding rate or mix I would use. If you want to use it for hay or grazing, then I would go with forage barley, forage oats, instead of regular barley and regular oats. Oftentimes I've heard from producers that they have some barley and oats in their bins. And if you are not planning to hay or graze, utilize that seed. But if you're using it for hay or graze, because the regular barley, the spikes on the airheads are slightly longer. And I've heard from guys that um, their livestock doesn't like it. So that's why the forage, forage barley, for example, um, the airheads do not have long spikes. So the cows like it. So that would be the only difference. Seeding rate will remain the same. Let's see, I see another question here <clears throat> from Kelly. You're, you're really testing us today, Kelly. Um, <laughs> And I had to look, so this is, uh, we asked a question about sorghum seed and I looked at our grazing cover crops booklet because Marisol has done a lot of work in that area for dry matter yield. So <clears throat> the question is, which is straight, which is better, straight Piper Sudan grass or sorghum Sudan hybrids? 
Um, so when I look at Marisol's table in here, she's got five and a half tons per acre dry matter yield on Sudan, just straight Piper Sudan grass. Um, and if so, if you're looking for yield or, you know, tons per acre here, um, the sorghum Sudan hybrids, some of those you can get up to seven and a half or 6.8 um, tons per acre. And that's the Pampa Verde Pacas. See, I'm going to butcher all these words again here because I don't have Sam. Um, but if you look in that grazing cover crops booklet on the NDSU Soil Health webpage, um, it's page four, three and four in there that she's got a bunch of tables on, on dry matter production. So if you if you want yield, um, if you want biomass from the from the Sudan grass or sorghum Sudan hybrids, then you can look at here in this in this booklet. Um, which residue would be easier to manage with a no-till disc drill between the two? Um, I suppose that would depend on how much how much biomass you get, and then also the the quality of that material. Um, I'm not sure which one stays vegetative for longer. Also, um, the CN ratio. So I would say that if there is a legume in that, that would help break down the residue faster. Yeah, and that's that's what I've heard. I had a, a farmer I work with. He planted on his PP last year. He did barley predominantly barley, radish, and he had some peas in there. Um, and some of the field, he didn't plant the peas deep enough, so they didn't establish very well. Um, but where he did get them deep enough and, and he got peas within that mix of barley and radish, um, he said the residue planting into this year was, was much different. It was actually easier to plant into um, than where he didn't have the peas. So like Naeem says, adding in a legume that has a, a low C to N ratio um, can really help with some of that, that grass residue and going into it the next next year. And this and this was a this is a farmer who's been, I think they've been 35 years no-till. Um, so he's not not concerned about residue, but he just said it was much, it planted much different and easier where he had the peas um, as part of the mix. Abby, do you remember the blend that we did last year? Um, our, that was almost it was mostly peas. We did 10 pounds of peas, and then we had a couple pounds of sedan grass. Uh, five pounds of oats, a couple pounds of radish, and, and a pound of sunflowers. We direct seeded um, almost all of the acres that we did last year, um, this year, into soybeans, and uh, it just worked phenomenal. We were seeding that stuff way before any of the other, uh, the other crop in the or other harvested crop in the area, um, just couldn't get around in it and whatnot. And, and it was level and, and uh, nice seed bed, so we didn't have to work it or anything. Oh, nice. And that was, I mean, those are fields you're just transitioning, right? To, to reduce till or no-till on those, or? Right, yep, so those two, those two that we had that we've been working on, um, you know, for the last four or five years, um, and then we had another, whatever, 400 acres or so of conventional till that we had seeded this cover on, um, all seeded between July 24th and August 1st. That last week in July, we seeded it, and uh, and that that seemed to be a really nice time frame. We got good growth. Um, I mean, the sunflowers were three, four feet tall, <laughs> and the rest of the the rest of the crop was uh, was looking good. But it was still it was still hanging together this spring, and uh, really worked well for what we were trying to do again this spring, in a wet spring. And so are you gonna stick with that mix? Or are you gonna put something else in there? What are you thinking about doing? We're thinking about substituting um, some millet, um, probably like some proso millet for our sedan grass. Um, but for the most part, I think we're gonna stick with that type of a blend. I was gonna visit with you a little bit more and see if there was anything we should tweak on that. Um, some of it, some of it, I was nervous. We're going to be moving to some of the acres that we've got that are PP this year will probably be corn. So I wanted to make sure there wasn't any big red flags that uh, that jumped out at me. Um, oftentimes we've been seeding soybeans following this, um, so we haven't had any issue. But and do you? I forget. Do you have strip till a strip till machine? We don't. No conventional till on on most of our other acres. 
Um, Cause I guess the only thing, maybe I think that's a good idea probably to swap out the millet for the, for the Sudan grass, especially have a little bit less biomass going into corn. Um, yeah, I don't think, I don't think there'd be a whole lot you could change on that. You know, you get some of the nitrogen in there, the nitrogen fixation from the peas. And um, one thing I've heard <clears throat> about peas, and this is from Joe Brecker, um, you know, he does that bio strip till on his fields after wheat. And he used to, when he was using peas instead of faba beans, he would put the peas uh, between where he was going to plant corn the next year, just because he didn't want that pea residue to wrap around his uh, residue managers. Um, and so that was one thing that he tried. I, I wouldn't swap out uh, faba bean for the peas because I think seeding it midsummer with faba bean, I think they're not going to grow as well as, as the peas would. Um, so I don't know, I guess that would be just one thing I'd look out for going into corn next year is to make sure that that pea residue isn't isn't going to wrap around your equipment at planting. There's a weed question. Um, <laughs> Kelly's last point. Oh, let's see. Okay. So which, well, okay. This is back to the sorghum, sorghum and Sudan hybrids. Um, which ones are higher producers of sorgoline or the root exudate that suppresses weeds? I have no idea. Joe, do you know anything about that? I don't know which one would produce more of that. Um, as far as the suppressive capability, that, that's again something that I'd have to really dig into the literature of which weeds were actually tested. Um, but I wouldn't have any good answers off the top of my head. And at least for this question, she's just wondering which one produces more out of those hybrids, and I don't know the answer to that one either. So Joe, though, you, I think you've talked about it on the field check episode this week, um, as to which, even with like cereal rye, as far as the, um, why am I drawing, drawing a blank on it? The allelopathic effect it can have. Um, it works better on certain size weed seeds versus others. Well, and that's, you know, so we know that there is some allelopathic chemicals or compounds that even cereal rye can produce. But when we talk about weed suppressive capabilities, especially with cereal rye, and it would also hold for other cover crops, it, it, we're really looking at more the biomass they produce. And it's, um, you know, some that will be also some extra production of the compounds, but really it's more of a, a biomass to prevent germination. Um, and so what I talked about in that field podcast is when we look at um, cereal rye, you know, we, we can get some, you know, at lower biomass, and it's, it's partly probably the compounds, also partly just competition. We won't see a reduction in the germination of weeds, but they'll be less competitive, um, and the overall biomass of the weeds will be lower compared to no, to no cover crop. When we talk about like true suppression or potential um, lower count numbers of weeds, that's when we have to get into really high biomass. And for the for rye, um, the research in the South is, you know, once you get over 10,000 pounds per acre of biomass, that we reduce the germination of weeds. And that's just because the mat is so thick that sunlight's not getting through to help the weeds germinate. And so in that case, I'd as I think I mentioned in the podcast, I don't know if in a normal, if we're using cover crops as like a pre-emergence, for instance, I don't know if a normal year we get to 10,000 pounds of biomass per acre before our typical planting window of crops. This is a, a different situation here. Let's see, we have another question. This is probably for Naeem. Um, on the salt ground mix that you mentioned, what else is good besides sugar beets? Um, can't plant sugar beets because the authority assist applied last spring and was told beets have a 40 month plant back after authority assist. It's a difficult question. <laughs> Cause um, you know, in terms of root crop, turnip and radish are not really salt tolerant. And then there's club root issue. Kale is very frost tolerant as a deep root system, but I'm not sure whether it's salt tolerant. Um, safflowers are another crap you could plant with uh, barley and oats, but you will 
and mostly have crops which are which are very high carbon i'm 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 gearing more towards adding something green so that um the residue breaks down quicker um it works for no-till situation as well as conventional till because then i've seen people conventionally till farmers they just till everything in the fall which basically kind of like um you know not good because you know um i don't know lucas to be honest with you if you want to have a loop if you just want to add some green um sweet clover um you know would if you're going with uh, barley and oats then sweet clover would be my choice it's not super salt tolerant but it'll work and it will add some green to the mix which in my view is key for the breakdown of the residue I wonder, Naeem, do you think there's like a, a happy medium? Um, you know, so we know to, to manage salts, we need to have residue um, to reduce evaporation from the surface, but, but then there can probably also be too much residue to, to manage and plant into. So I don't know if there's like a happy medium that you think we could get to where you can have enough to, to reduce evaporation, but also, um, especially in your area in the Northeast, I mean, you guys don't have a huge mm -hmm. window for planting mm -hmm. the soils to warm up. Happy medium in terms of planting dates or? Or just, you know, in the, in the amount of biomass that you have, you know, you want some of it to stick around. You don't want it to all decompose. Um, so like say you had yeah. a lot of, I guess, I guess in your area, you wouldn't have a lot of radish and turnip because of the club root issues um, to canola. Um, yeah. But, you know, if you have too much of that and it breaks down the residue on a saline field, then you're still going to have that massive mm -hmm. evaporation, you know, but if you have too much residue, then all of a sudden you're, you know, farmers up in that area can't get in the field because there's just too much residue holding in moisture. Um, um, what we saw in 2017, actually a uh, farmer was very worried about too much residue, like Abby mentioned, and he had actually turnips um, uh, and then chickling vetch and forage oats. And it was quite a bit of residue biomass and he clipped it. And there was hardly anything in the spring. Um, so I would say that after November 1st, for example, if you go by the 100% PP payments, um, I would clip it. I would clip it. If you're worried about residue um, for the next spring, and as long as there is decent green in your mix, I think you shouldn't have any problems because that uh, field I'm talking about, it was 500 acres, close to 500 acres, and it was more than two feet tall growth. And it's northeast, um, more cooler, you know. I also want to address the, the other part of that question. Um, so for... On pages 112 and 113 of the weed guide, we have rotation to crops after all the herbicides we apply. And so indeed there, you have 40 months to sugar beets after authority assist. Uh, but that also covers, you know, the crops following, the, the crops are listed on the label. There's other things, you know, like so Naeem said potentially sweet clover, you're never gonna find rotation interval to sweet clover on herbicide label and many other cover crops uh, because the, the companies when they write the labels are worried about injury onto subsequent crops. So kind of the backup language that you're starting to see appear on labels is to conduct a bioassay uh, in situations like cover crops, for instance, to see how those plants would grow. Because sometimes it's residue related, more often than not, it is injury to crops in subsequent years. And so if you still have time, if you're thinking about a mid-July planting, basically a bioassay means you go and you dig up some of the soil in the area you want to plant, put it in a bucket, plant whatever cover crops you're thinking about in, in that bucket on that soil, and water them and, and watch them for about a month. And if they grow normally, then in this case, since, since the end use of the beets would not be for sugar production or extraction, there's a small chance that they could be okay. Uh, but also you could put that sweet clover in there if it grows normally for these purposes, then 
then that would be conducted as a bioassay and you'd be uh, more confident in the in that that plant would be okay in that situation. So that, that's something, you know, if we're still thinking of mid-July planting, there's time for that. Bioassays do take about a month to be confident. So that, that's still an option on some of these if maybe and or but type of questions about um, planting a cover crop after a herbicide application from last year. Are there generally any cover crops, Joe, that you think are just more tolerant of, of herbicide residual that, that, you know, if you didn't do a bioassay, you could feel pretty good that, that it's going to do okay? No, it's a terrible uh, cereal, <laughs> cereal rye is about the best as far as, as tolerance. Uh, many of these sorghum sedans I'd feel pretty confident about for just as a painting of, of a broad spectrum brush on this. Uh, but rye and the sorghum sedans, the ones that get trickier once you get into the brassica families. Um, so certainly those, um, the radishes, turnips, uh, they tend to be more sensitive to more of the herbicides that we use. And I guess, you know, some of those herbicides are broken down biologically. Um, then say a more bi biologically active soil may, you know, maybe those farmers, I don't know. And, and this is printing, this is totally generalizing and not something we, but at least to give you a ballpark idea. But I've heard, you know, some farmers that have very active, biologically active soils, you know, their herbicide residuals, if they're broken down biologically, aren't, aren't there for very long. And they can get away with, with cover crops that maybe in another system that isn't as biologically active can't can't get away with well the, the good rule of thumb is is your organic matter more organic matter the more um or less likely for injury because of a herbicide breakdown i don't think we have any true good data on you know no-till versus conventional till breakdown and, but we do have a lot more information on organic matter so I'm going to build upon Joe's point, actually. That's a very crucial point, even when it comes to the breakdown of residue. If we have high organic matter levels, like Abby said, uh, soil microbes would be more active and the population would be high. You could actually get away with producing more biomass. Just like they break down the you know, herbicides quicker, they will break down residue also quicker. But then it will also mean that it would require more nitrogen to break down the residue. Um, Abby, coming back to, I just thought about one point, you said happy medium. I would say that in the Northeast, uh, the year, the example I gave in 2017, when we had more than uh, two feet of growth of cover crop, that cover crop was planted in late July. Um, now, I depend, I would say that around Fargo, you will get more growth than us most years. So if you're worried about too much biomass, I would say plant your cover crops after 20th of July. That would be, and I, there's no, nothing set in a stone. You know, every year is kind of like different, but then I would be slightly cautious. I, I wouldn't plant it a bit too early because the earlier you plant, you're gonna get more growth. Um, and if you're worried about that, actually, um, you know, if grazing or haying would have been an option, I would go and plant the cover crop right now, and I could get two crops out of it. I could hay it or graze it, and, and then hay or graze the regrowth. But if you're worried about the biomass, wait until July 20th, get everything ready, and then plant it. I suppose, you, you know, that brings up good points, too, on, on this. If and I've known farmers that have done this too, that if it, if it feels like it's getting too dry and they're concerned about moisture next spring, uh, which seems hard to believe right now, but, but I've had farmers that have sprayed out, you know, terminated their cover crop um, just to conserve moisture because they weren't sure that they were gonna get the recharge that they needed uh, for the following spring. So that may be an option on some sandier soils if you feel like, like they're PP this year and you want to use some moisture throughout the profile, but you also don't want to rob yourself of moisture in the spring. I mean, that's the great thing about cover crops is you can always spray them out and terminate them. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that's a good, a good thing to think about too. And to not be afraid of, of terminating a cover crop. If you, if you feel like there's too much biomass or that you're going to not have enough moisture, which I know is hard to believe right now, but as dry as it feels right now with all this heat and wind, 
Um, who knows what it's going to be like. Um, we have another, let's see, another question here on uh, mentioning, let's see, Kelly says, we mentioned using two pounds of sorghum Sudan in a mix. Would you say three pounds of Piper Sudan grass would be too much in a mix? Um, you know, the, the two pounds comes from a lot of the work that Marisol has done. Um, she's messed around with seeding rates on sorghum Sudan and she's put six pounds in and she's put one pound in and, you know, and tested all these different rates and two pounds seems to be where she felt like, like there's enough biomass, but it didn't, the sorghum didn't dominate the mix. Um, so I'm guessing the Sudan grass would be very similar to that. Um, you know, I think if you want to use a bunch of moisture, putting in three pounds is not a bad thing. But if you're, you're putting that in with, um, with clovers and a bunch of other stuff, right? Um, I have to go back here. Yeah, if you're putting that in with, with peas and soybean and clovers, your clovers probably won't show up that much in the mix if you have three pounds of Sudan grass. So I would maybe just keep it at two if you want those other species to, to be part of the mix and not to be dominated by, by Sudan grass. But that's just a gut feeling. I, I, too bad Marisol's not here to really answer that. Um, and then we also have, oh boy, these are a lot of words I don't know, Joe. So I'll let you read that one in the chat box. <laughs> yes, yeah, she's just asking if we could add 12 ounces of uh, LV6, so six pound 240 ester, 10 days for planting without injury. Without injury is the interesting question. So, uh, you know, the, the other thing I can point people to is page six on the weed control guide is planting crops after our burn down herbicides. And, you know, 240 yesterday was all read about a month for, um, for that rate, I believe it's a month for oats, pea, soybean, for, for most of those things in that mix. And again, back to if it's planted as a crop, the companies have seen enough potential for injury across a number of site years that it's on there as a month for a reason because that way they don't get a phone call to go to the field to uh, um, to walk an injury complaint. There's also kind of, as in all biological systems, a uh, well maybe or a, um, no hard answer here. If you have a lot of weed growth, a lot of that too in the weeds that you're applying them to. And in this case, you know, zero injury, I don't know, I can't say that you won't see any injury. Um, some of those may be injured more than others, uh, but also are now into the summer. And so especially if it's kind of a wetter soil, warmer, there's gonna be some more degradation plus the weeds there. I, I'd say most of those will, will probably come up. Um, may have some stunting and so in that case you know if it's one of these mixes and, and if you stunt some of your peas clovers you know that your broad leaves then like abby's kind of said your sedan may kind of dominate the mix then just because of an earlier start um so you know a lower rate would be less of a chance of injury um but of course, your the main goal here is to control the weeds before planting. So I, I think in general they'd probably be okay, but I'd I'd have to lean towards the side of caution that you probably see some injury and some early a chance of some early stunting on some of those, particularly the the broad leaves in that mix. Someone raised their hand. I saw that pop up on my screen while I was talking. I see that, Chris. There's an accidental hand raise like he was sleeping and jerked, jerked awake or something. I did that the other day in a meeting and I was like, how do you put that hand down? I didn't know how to put it down. Um, so Chris, I don't know if you, if you want to unmute and ask a question or something, you're welcome to. Or um... Oh, what, I was going to say, Joe, too. Yeah, sorry about that one. No, I was, I was going down the road and I was just swapping over on my phone as I was driving here and I accidentally rose my hand. I do apologize about that. <laughs> That's all right, Chris. <clears throat> well, your, your hand's going to stay up. Oh, no. I, I, can low I lowered your hand for you. <laughs> so you're not volunteering anymore. Um, 
Oh, the one thing I was gonna gonna say is that usually with with herbicides, you know, um, we want you to have a strong herbicide program first, and then pick the cover crops to fit that herbicide, not the other way around. So, <clears throat> so Kelly, I would do what you're what you're planning to do for a herbicide, and then if you need to drop or swap some, some things in the mix, do that, but make sure you have good weed control uh, with your herbicide program. One thing I would add for Kelly that you know today for example is june 17th and if kelly went and tried to spray like not just have a window maybe a 20 25 days window then you know not only she could have the herbicide program but she could go with uh, say for example if she's able to spray this weekend uh, it'll be what like uh, 20 19th or 20th uh, of June. So if you wait for say 25, 30 days more even, you're looking at planting your cover crop mix say about July 20th. I would say that that would be a still very good day to plant a cover crop mix. And you completed, you know, so there would be chances of the herbicide injury would be almost zero. And, and, and so you could get the best of the both worlds, actually. Now look, there's a thumbs up emoji before unmuting myself just to say I agree. <laughs> oh, there it is. There we go. <laughs> uh, again, crazy with the emojis, Joe. <clears throat> uh, so I see Julianne from Lamore County is on. Um, on the call. I don't want to put you on the spot, Julianne, but how are things looking down there as far as, I think you guys have a lot of unharvested corn that's going to be PP this year. Good morning. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, I was driving around yesterday and we do have a lot of unharvested corn. Um, I'd probably say though, in terms of percentages, it's probably 20% or less. Um, I have seen a lot of those big weeds in the fields like you're talking about because we still have a lot of areas that I don't think farmers are going to be able to get into at all. There's just so much water and I just noticed in the forecast we're going to have rain again over the weekend. So yay. <laughs> um, I don't know. I really feel for these guys. It's terrible out there. I think they've lost a lot of acreage that they were kind of counting on from um, the previous year, which had already been underwater, I mean, that just kind of got worse. So I wonder, I mean, it would be great to have a plan, you know, for those, those corn acres that were harvested this spring. Um, so we talked about the weed management on those, you know, if the weeds are too big, you need to, you need to till it. Um, unless you're in a no-till system and then you look at something like, like burning the residue, which may help with some of the weeds um, prior to, to planting a cover crop. Um, but I'm trying to think of, you know, we talked last, I think it was last week, we talked about options for a cover crop on those corn acres that probably will be going to soybean um, next year. And we kept things kind of simple on those acres. I mean, I, I think we had talked mostly about using oats or barley or some kind of uh, cool season grass, and then also maybe some millet in there to have some kind of warm season. Um, if you are going to soybean, I wanted to mention these. That here are the host crops um, for cover crops that are host to SCN that you'd want to stay away from. So like chickling vetch, a crimson clover, field pea, forage pea, hairy vetch, turnip, both pointer and purple top turnips, and white lupin. Um, so you want to make sure you steer clear of those if you, if you have SCN in your fields. Um, so especially going to soybean, we probably want to make sure um, that we stay away from some of those species, but. Okay, and then you had said on the website there was a chart that listed that. Um, yes. Is it on your soil health website or is it on Marisol's? Because it was um, on the soil health one and I couldn't find it. Yeah, it's on the soil health one. Um, so it's on, if you go to the NDSU soil health homepage, um, yep. then we have a link on there where you can click to prevent a plant and uh, cover crop information. And then this one, it seems like there gets to be more and more stuff on this all the time. Uh, but there's a green button that says host and non-host cover crops of soybean cyst nematode. 
so that's thank you yeah it's it's after the videos and stuff um oh okay and then i think part of the thing too around here um that corn is still on is they tried to every time they tried to get the corn off the field they just got buried yeah, yeah so I've, I've been talking with aaron day a lot about that with um with the ruts that are out there and how to manage those um and he's, he's basically said we need to create a good seed bed. Um, so you want to do some kind, of, some kind of vertical tillage, some kind of shallow tillage. You don't want to drag anything deep into the field because it's so wet underneath. Um, but if you do something shallow just to get a good seed bed, whether it's for your cover crop now or to kind of prep it for next year, he says to just that we're going to let the roots do the work on the compaction areas. Um, and, and, and not using steel. Um, now granted, if you had combines that were buried out there and had to be dug out with an excavator and stuff like that, I mean, those, those are just gonna need to be repaired. Um, but for the ruts in the field that maybe were left on fields that weren't too bad, um, some kind of vertical tillage would be, would be good. Um, that's what we, we had to do that at the share farm in Morton this year. We, had, we were in four or five years of no-till, but on the um, untiled ground we had to run vertical tillage over it because there were some pretty bad ruts from harvest this spring. Um, but yeah, if you, if you run any kind of um, ripper and you know, anything like that, that's going to go deep into the soil right now with as wet as it is under there, it's just going to smear and it's going to compact and you'll see reduced yields for, for several years um, in those areas. And Aaron was also saying a lot of these soils feel like pudding. You know, you, you, they're dry at the surface, but they're just so wet underneath. And there's this interesting thing that's happening, which, um, which all this, this water underneath the surface of the soil is putting enough pressure on the surface that's the same weight of the soil, actually. So if you think about how heavy soil is, um, if you're always you know, carrying around bags of soil like I am, you know how heavy it is, that there's enough pressure up from that water down below that's moving in and, and moving across the landscape as uh, there's as much pressure up as there is weight coming down from the soil and that's creating these almost jello like situations which is which is really crazy um, so subsurface drainage is going to be what's going to help manage those areas in the future all right thank you Anybody else have a question they want to ask or type or? If not, I'd have to pull up an email, but I did get an interesting one um, yesterday. Um, and now you can hear my son is coming out to get something to eat. <laughs> so um, I got a question yesterday about cutworms in fields where they had cereal rye and they planted soybean into it. Um, so I wanna share with you what Jan Canodal told us. Um, this is actually from Chris P at, at Agassiz asked this question about it because one of his growers was seeing it. I'm sure why we, um, let's see, army worm and black cutworms are two common pest problems where planting soybeans into green cover crops. And Jan checked this out in Minnesota, Indiana, Michigan, Delaware, and Alabama. So many let's see many calls and concerns with army worm damage in that scenario some of the damage especially to hypocotyls look much like cutworm feeding though we're trying to convince folks that army worm are slowly starving to death i su suspect some spray to protect the remaining stand uh, may be necessary uh, happens mostly when producers plant green either intentionally or because herbicides don't get didn't get sprayed or are slow to work in cool temperatures and this is out of somebody at purdue um, so that is one other thing to kind of watch out for if you're using cereal rye as a tool um, and you're creating, I mean, it's essentially creating an environment, right? Because it's, it's a soil that's not being disturbed now and that, that could create an environment for some of these army worms or cutworms um, to, to overwinter or survive. So I just wanted to bring that up because I thought that was kind of interesting. That was a new question that I've gotten. Um, let's see, Kelly's asking in July, is July 15th early? Uh, July 15th planting too early for fava bean. Um, I would say for cover crop, it shouldn't be 
um, well, it shouldn't be early. Guys, we have faba beans here. And as a, we, we have planted faba beans as a crop to harvest for, you know, uh, grain. They've already been planted. Um, I think it would be at least three weeks now. I wouldn't say it would be a bit too early. I think you guys have a lot better luck up north too with faba bean. Um, I've seen some fields like where faba beans been planted early, like like right on that along the South Dakota border, um, where it is just a stand for for grain for seed production, um, and it it didn't do very well that far south, which seems like it's really not that far south, but. Um, but I wonder if up in that northeast, you know, the northern part of the state, you guys probably have better luck because it's, it's colder. Um, that is true. But it doesn't really like a lot of uh, water. So one year, we had too much rain, so Faba Bean didn't do well. So, but like if you think about what, what was the planting date roughly, Abby, when it didn't do well up there? Um, you know, down on the South Dakota border, it was probably, I mean, it was planted as a, as a full season crop um, mm -hmm. to harvest. So, um, yeah, they just didn't get a very good stand of it. So it would have mm -hmm. been planted early. Um, but yeah, I agree with you that you probably, you know, midsummer, especially in the northern part of the state, you'd be fine with it. And probably even in the southern part, I think you'd be okay. I don't know. I think, I don't know. Um, I, I think that as a cover crop, July 15th, like we, we are still like today is 17th. We are, we are looking, you know, one month down the road and I, I think we should be okay. I mean, every year, again, every year is different. And then like uh, fava beans is a bit sensitive to saturated soils, you know, um, it's not super salt tolerant either. So uh, there are lots of other things which can play a role, but as far as regular general planting date is concerned, I think you should be okay. I know that the one that we don't recommend planting early, um, or at least not, you don't plant it till October is um, the winter camelina cover crop that we've been working with. Um, if you plant that too early, um, it just doesn't, doesn't do well. So you'd want to save that one as, as, you know, plant your full season cover crop and then come in later and seed something like, like winter camelina and, and winter rye, cereal rye. Um, but that's the only one we're finding really sensitive, unless it's kind of under the canopy of corn if it's interseeded and it just kind of hangs out there and doesn't get full growth. Um, but that one's pretty sensitive. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, so does anyone have a question or feel they want to bring up that they want all these great minds to to think about. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, when it comes to putting cover crops on PP, um, just really think about the crop you want to put in next year. Um, so make sure that if you're going to go to wheat next year, that you're not putting something like, like cereal rye on that field. Um, you know, there are just some things that you just really, you know, if you want to stay flexible with what you can plant next year, then go with oats. You know, you could kill out oats, any volunteer oats in a, with a wild oat herbicide or something like that in a, in a wheat crop, I think. Right, Joe? Uh, there's, there's certainly more options, but the other thing is you can always terminate it before it goes to seed this year too. Yeah, so just, or just terminate yeah. before planting next year. Okay. So yeah, just be really aware of what you're going to plant next year. Um, oats, I think, give you the most flexibility. Um, I feel like oats, as far as the residue that you're going to plant into, I think is the most mellow. Um, you know, you obviously want to be aware of herbicide residual because you want to make sure that what you what you seed out there that you're not going to go in with a thirty dollar an acre mix and get you know fifteen bucks an acre out of it. You know, where where you're just getting limited species to grow. Um, so I just want everybody to be careful of that. Um, I have another question here: opinion on clover rates? Beer seam five pounds or red five pounds or sweet clover four pounds? 
um, one clover species would be included in each mix. Is this too much or too little? I think if you're, you know, if you're seeding clovers at five pounds an acre, it's probably getting pretty expensive on seed costs. Um, and I, man, I just wrote about it for the Soil Health Minute this week, and I can't remember what we put in there. Let me look um, and see what rates we're Abby, using. Abby, on its own, uh, Marisol has mentioned that um, sweet clover, for example, would be 12 pounds per acre. So it depends how much, uh, you know, you want uh, sweet clover in the mix. Um, 20 to 30% should be good, you know. So roughly that would come about two and a half to three pounds, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm at on my mixes, I'm only using a pound of clover. Pound of clover, okay. Yeah. And this, I mean, this is stuff we're seeding in between rows on 60 inch corn. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm only at a pound of, of clover, like two pounds of buckwheat, two pounds of phacelia. We're going to include some of that. Um, winter pea, five pounds. Flax, two pounds. I kind of have a two pound or less rule. I don't know. I just feel like any, most things, if you're not sure what to seed, two pounds usually will do it. Um, for some of that stuff like flax or clovers or alfalfa like vernal alfalfa or um, radish or turnip or things like that. I usually just go two pounds or less. Um, so, so you might be a little heavy at five. I don't know. You could cut it back to three probably and save yourself some money too. Yeah, I think I've, I've seen some mixes where where the rates on clovers were pretty high and it got really expensive pretty quick. So um, I don't know, but you wanted to establish too. I'm assuming she's talking about the same mix which had soybean, uh, peas, and then um, sorghum yeah. sedan grass. I think that between two to two and a half pounds would be good because that would be about 20% of the sweet clover in that. She already got peas in that. That's another legume. So, oh, okay, so clovers, will, yeah, clovers will be planted by themselves in a mid row between 10 inch rows of other cover mixed together. Oh. Yeah, I'm really not sure. I don't know if anyone. But then they would still be in the same field, correct? Yeah, I mean, they're just going to be between 10 inch. Yeah. So if you're planting them in the same mix, what you're doing is you're basically planting clovers in between the other mix. I would still consider that part of the cover crop mix, you know? So if your clover seed rate is a bit too high, I, I, I don't know. I, I would still be around three pounds, not more than three pounds, maybe. No. Yeah, maybe just kind of split the difference between the five and the, and the two at three. <laughs> Give it a shot. I mean, you could always, in that field, why don't, you, know, you could try two pounds in some strips. You could try three pounds. You could try, you know, if this is a practice you want to use in the future, um, then you can learn something from it and figure out what rates you want to use um, by putting in strips like that. I know it's a pain to probably recalibrate and whatever, but but that may be the most useful useful way to figure out what you want to do. Abby, you may want to mention to everyone the the publication or booklet we are putting together, which will have, say, wheat perspective, insect perspective, you know. Yeah. I think that would be wonderful. So you may want to mention it too. You know. Yeah, hopefully we can get it put together. I've heard back from half the people that I asked to write for it. <laughs> so, Naeem, you were the first to give me all the content. Um, we decided that after, this, after the call last week that it might just be good to have a, a booklet on preventive planting and cover crop options. So, um, so we're starting to put that together. I don't know if it'll be ready for this year. Um, we were gonna try, but, um, but we'll see, at least it would be ready for the future. 
but there'll be sections on, uh, you know, on weed management and concerns, herbicide residual, uh, disease transfer for broadleafs and grasses, insect pressures and differences or change, you know, what you need to expect there. Um, I think we're going to frame write a section on um, RMA guidelines, things you need to know. Um, One suggestion I have, Abby, for that, um, like the questions we are getting during these uh, cafe talks, when people are asking about, um, say, a particular mix, how about if we, at the end, we also create um, some um, example mixes, but by using those examples, which we are getting from this group during these cafe talks, and then write down pros and cons. So like if you, so say Kelly, the mix she um, is asking about today, we could use it as an example. And then, you know, seating rates and this and that, and then also pros and cons, you know? Mm -hmm. So we could actually have seven, eight different type of example mixes, which came as questions uh, from this group. So yeah. that it's not just the, you know, the different aspects of planting cover crops on pre plant, but real life examples, you know, people, some, someone may like one example and go with that. Someone may like the other one. Yeah, we could certainly do that. I think I left two pages for something like that. And um, I mean, we could also just include different scenarios throughout the book that will just help people you know, I think the biggest thing on this is thinking through the process, not necessarily getting, you know, specific numbers or, you know, but, but thinking through it and, and how you're going to create these mixes that, that really are suitable for your farm because everything is so customized um, that I think that thought process is really helpful. So if people could see what we take, you know, we take an example mix and then we think through it and the end product, you know, um, that maybe that would be helpful. We'll have to see what we can, what we can figure out for, for creating something like that. Well, we have just a couple minutes left, so I want to make sure uh, that we answered any questions that people have um, before we sign off. And I think we have one more next week on Wednesday, and then hopefully everybody will, will have what they need to plant cover crops. Um, we really do appreciate everybody taking the time to be on the call this morning and sharing your ideas and thoughts with us. Um, and for really, I mean, my brain is really thinking this morning <laughs> with some of these questions. And after all these cafe talks, they've been, it really gets us thinking. So thank you. Um, any other questions that, before we close out the meeting? There's one, I think. So, oh yeah. Uh, Colin mentioned Piper Sudan grass has thinner stalks than sorghum Sudan. Would you say this would be easier to handle with a distril um, because of thinner stocks. Is Colin still on here? No. Well, sometimes thinners can be <laughs> slightly tougher uh, to cut. Um, depends. You know, that would be a good question, Kelly. I don't know if um, Marisol may be on the call next week, and that may be if you if you check in next week if you have time. Um, but as far as sorghum sedan, I mean, she's. She's been to all kinds of international conferences as a guest speaker because she knows so much about it. Um, so if you really, you know, want to ask some of those questions, she's very, very knowledgeable. Um, yeah, hopefully she'll be, I think she's going to plan to be on next week since she couldn't make it this week. All right, well, we will sign off for this week. And then, um, yeah, if you think of something that you guys have questions on, come back and check in next week. And you can certainly, right off the bat, ask your question and then take off if you need to. So um, thanks for joining us, though. And, um, and good luck. Let us know if you have any other questions. Uh, you can certainly email or, or call um, if you need it. So thank you. Mm -hmm.